As we continue our series in considering matters that receive scant, if any, attention in our time, and yet there are basic lessons from God's own word that uh, we must, certainly we must not uh, forget. So, we're going to look at the, the subject of who God is, and we're going to take just one aspect, the unsparing God. Will you turn, please, to Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter uh, chapter 2. Those who offend God do not like the Bible's disclosure of who God is. It makes people very, very uncomfortable. Those who offend God do not like the Hebrew scriptures we call the Old Testament. I was with men for a while, men nationally known, teachers, college and seminary professors, nationally known pastors, who privately revealed that they did not like the first 11 chapters of Genesis, or they could not defend, the way they put it, the God of the Bible. Some even said that they did not believe the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, not believing that these were inspired words. Sometimes I wish I could convey to this audience the impression that something like that gives to a young man, a young pastor, as he listens to those who are his elders and superiors in matters of religion and theology, who express themselves that way in private, though they would not reveal it at that time publicly though since that time some have written books in defense of their position. Now those who are offended by God prefer to create a God after their own imagination. They prefer to create a God in their own image as it is stated in Psalm 50, verse 21. Because they do not like the God of the Bible. We've had to teach in our Bible Institute over the years that in our study of learning who God is, we find that there are so many things that the natural man does not like about God and furthermore that the natural man is quite uncomfortable with the truth that is revealed and for a long time in the early history of mankind there was a long record of people not really wanting God there was a time when we read of when they began to call upon the name of the Lord. There were men like Enoch who walked with God and had fellowship with God, but it's not said of many. And there was someone like Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord and who was willing to submit himself fully to the Lord's leading. When people create a God in their own imagination, 
the devil helps them the devil will help them to pro and he will provide a religion that will suit their fancy or a theology that will gratify their lusts for power for prestige for notoriety there are three reasons why people like that do not like the second epistle of Peter there are three reasons especially why they do not like the second epistle of Peter do you know what those three reasons are there are more but I mentioned three specifically well the first reason they do not like second Peter is chapter one the second reason is chapter two and the third reason is chapter three because the first chapter emphasizes the authority of the word of God and gives a definition of divine inspiration that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit you won't find a better definition of inspiration than that and in the second chapter there is the exposure of false prophets those who introduce a pseudo Christianity a substitute Christianity for the apostolic faith false teachers and their judgment then in the third chapter there is reference to the coming again of the Lord Jesus and the judgment of God upon the ungodly. We're going to look at 2 Peter to begin with, verses 4, 5, and 6. 4, and our subject is the unsparing God. For if God spared not the angels that sinned and cast them down to hell and deliver them and took chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved Noah and the eighth bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned them with an overthrow making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly let's look at that first of all God spared not the angels that sinned this is pre-Adamic way back we learn a little bit more about that in other passages of scripture as for example with regard to the fall of Satan in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Ezekiel chapter 28 the angels that sin these beings exalted and different and celestial and above human beings we might say and yet when they rebelled against God and sin is rebellion they were punished and reserved for judgment by this God who is unsparing. Then we read of the old world. He didn't spare that old world of humanity in the days of Noah where a whole society 
the whole population was drowned with the exception of those eight persons, Noah, his sons and their wives. It's a frightening thing. When you begin to read God's word, and by the way, this is within those 11 chapters of Genesis. You begin to read this and it frightens you. As we were singing a little while ago, by God's word, my sin, I learned. Man does not like this at all. The flesh doesn't like it. And then he spared not the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The awful atrocities, sexual perversion, immorality of those cities. And God sent fire from heaven and destroyed them all. Those who have had an interest in an understanding of archaeology tell us that that area was at one time like the Garden of Eden. And yet God turned the whole thing into ashes. And for a reason that those who live after that time should learn what will happen to them if they live ungodly. The unsparing God. He spared not the angels that sinned. He spared not the old world under Noah, in the days of Noah. And he spared not the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We can then turn to Romans chapter 11 and read more of the unsparing God. In Romans chapter 11, verse 21 through 22. Romans 11, 21 and 22. We haven't time to read the full context. But it has to do with the nation of Israel, has to do with the Jews. And this is an admonition to the Gentiles. Because when Israel rejected the Messiah, who died for them as well as for other sinners in the world, the good news of the gospel of the grace of God went out to the Gentile world. Privilege to enter into God's goodness. And here is the admonition uh, personalized in this, in this uh, pronoun, but it has to do with the Gentile society. Notice carefully now, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity. But Toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. Some years ago, we heard Pastor Mason in Bucksport, and I'm sorry to hear that he's leaving that ministry, but he's going into uh, a home missionary a ministry of church planting he said that it seemed that America was in the post Christian era in other words it's gone it's gone 
And those of us who are old enough to know a little bit out of our own experience what the mood was in society in America some years ago compared with what it is now. And those of us who may have been privileged to read a little history, we see that there's a tremendous change has taken place. And it seems that the Gentiles are being cut off. The non-Jews are being cut off. They've had so much light. Just think of the Western world, the so-called civilization, where God used scholars to translate the Holy Scriptures not only into English, but into so many languages. And now in our time, there are over a thousand languages or more that have been translated by people who benefited by the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the church attendance in England? What is the church attendance in the United States? In these countries that have had so much light, what is the situation in Sweden, the country of my parents? What's happened there and in the, in the lowlands? What's happened? An awful thing has happened. You know, unless God blesses, there will be no blessing. And unless the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, there will be no sorrow for sin. Unless God works upon the hearts and minds and emotions and the sensibilities of men, there will be no repentance and no conversion. If God cuts them off from his favor, they're going down, going down fast. And we have evidences from history. We have evidences in scripture such as we have just read about the unsparing God who will tolerate so much only so long and then there is the cutoff. And isn't there a warning to those of us who have been privileged to sit under the teaching of the word of God and to hear the gospel and the explanation of so many things in scripture that if we turn from his goodness and get out from under his goodness, we will be cut off from his blessing. It will be a sad, sad thing. It seems to be happening all over where the gospel was once heralded and honored. And something else has taken its place. Instead of turning to God in sorrow for sin and in heart belief in what Christ accomplished, and the cross of Calvary, a new message has come in that calls itself Christian and evangelical. And it usually comes in the way of an admonition and a call and an invitation to declare yourself in favor of Jesus or to declare yourself wanting to uh, emulate him or follow him. But the matter of real conversion, we see very little evidence of it today. Take heed, Gentiles, lest thou also be cut off. As we look at this subject of the unsparing God, we ought also to go back a couple of pages to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And just two verses here. Verses 31 and 32. Romans 8. 31 and 32. And this is a chapter on assurance for true believers. What shall we say then to these things? 
If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son. He spared not the angels that sinned. He spared not the old civilization in the days of Noah. He spared not the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He spared not his own chosen people, Israel. And this unsparing God, he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now that we are saved, God is committed to us irreversibly. I hope you believe that. And in verse 33, who then shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The devil cannot bring a charge against us, nor prevail in using any means to separate us from the un sparing God do you like this composite picture it was a frightening picture wasn't it when we began our study just on that subject of the unsparing God it shakes you and it ought to and then to think that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life is your faith in Jesus do you believe in the unsparing God do you realize there is a judgment upon society and upon nations and upon individuals and God's judgments are not only temporal but God's judgments are also eternal and this unsparing God, regardless of all of the arguments that people might raise and say, oh, oh, why be so harsh on angels? Why be so harsh on, on, on a civilization? And so many, many people drowned. Why be so harsh on cities like Sodom and Gomorrah with all of its homosexuality and everything else? Why not? have a, a, a God that's kind and loving and, 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 and uh, overlooking things. And isn't that the mood today? Isn't it? But he's an unsparing God. And he goes all the way. He could have condemned the whole race and be a just God in doing it. But he chose instead to spare not his own son to suffer and bleed and die the ignominious death of Calvary that any sinner anywhere might believe on him and have eternal life and be taken in to the divine embrace by the unsparing God. And he who did not spare his own son, but gave himself for us as a sacrifice for sin, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Don't you love this God now? But don't you see, and this is a great truth in a, in a, a what say, well, in the capsule form on the unsparing God don't you see how the natural man fights and resists what the Bible reveals about God 
And therefore, he never comes to the place where he appreciates what God has done to save man. How can we appreciate the depth of God's love, the wonder of his grace, unless in contrast we see that he who spared not civilizations and cities and nations spared not his own son that you and I might have eternal life and be with him throughout all eternity. I'm so glad that we sang tonight years I spent in vanity and pride caring not my Lord was crucified knowing not it was for me he died. And by God's word at last I learn how then, 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 how was it? Uh, and, and how his law I'd spurn. And then I turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me and there my burdened soul found liberty. Now, do you like God better? Honestly, now. Don't you want to serve him? Don't you want to live for him? Doesn't it move upon us, soul and spirit and mind and heart, that this is the God of the Bible and he's real and he's wonderful. He spared not his own son. And then you realize what a horrible thing it will be for men and women anywhere who reject salvation. They are without excuse. They have no excuse whatever. Take heed. And to such we would say, take heed, lest he spare not thee. I wonder how many here in this audience at this time are willing to say from the heart, I will serve the unsparing God. With all of my soul, with all of my being, whatever talents I have, I want to serve him who spared not his own son, but gave him up freely for our sins, so that no one anywhere can lay any charge to God's own. Let's thank him for it. Our Father, we pray that as this meeting comes to a close and, and the men go to their prayer time, that each of us will have entered into a deeper appreciation of the God who's being abused today, misrepresented today, And that we might realize that in this privilege in which we live, called the goodness of God, we indeed should be a rejoicing, a rejoicing people and concerned about rescuing the perishing. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.